Joining me now here in the studio uh, is Peter Schiff, president of Euro-Pacific Capital, well known to most of you as a regular uh, on Freedom Watch, and Dr. Yaron Brook, the president of the Ayn Rand Institute. How appropriate that you two defenders of the free market should be here today when this monstrosity came out. And the monstrosity of which I speak, I don't know if you either of you had a chance to look at this, is just the 85-page wish list. This is the, the summary from the White House Working Group of what it wants to become law. In order for this to become law, the statute would probably be about that thick, probably about a thousand pages, yeah. which nobody in the Congress will read, but probably all Democrats and even many Republicans will vote for. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole thing is a disaster. I mean, first of all, the financial service industry is already overregulated. I mean, I'm a member of it. You know, I'm on a hiring freeze right now. I inadvertently violated a rule. I hired too many people, and so now I've been ordered not to hire any more. Who ordered you to do that? FINRA. And they might actually. What act is FINRA? Well, they're the regulatory agency that already exists. I mean, they're making more to regulate me, but apparently I hired too many people, and now I haven't been able to hire people. I'm probably going to get a fine, maybe a hundred thousand dollar fine, because I hired too many people. But I mean, the, the whole thing is the industry is overregulated. All this is going to do is further impede the effectiveness, the efficiency in our industry. It's going to it's going to drive down the quality of financial services and financial advice and right. drive up the cost. And the, the crazy part about this is making the Fed the <sighs> systemic regulator. It's the Fed and the government that create the systemic Precisely. risk. The Fed created the risk by keeping interest rates too low, and now look where they are. They're zero. And we now we want to regulate all the companies that are too big to fail because of the systemic risk. But there's only a systemic risk because the government made them too big to fail. If the government said they would fail, there would be no risk. Before I get to Dr. Brooke, I have to follow up with this. I did not realize that you were subject to the imposition of a fine of this magnitude. Now, one of the unique things about you is, aside from being a nice guy and a courageous person, you not only understand the economy, you understand the Constitution. Would you engage lawyers to challenge the ability of the government under our Constitution <laughs> to micromanage your business and impose a fine of this magnitude? You know how much that would cost me? I, I, know, probably... I know, but I can see your lawyers saying to Barney Frank on the witness stand, where in the Constitution well, I mean, do you get look, the authority look, to do Judge, this? Look at this thing they just passed uh, a week ago about tobacco. I mean, when the government first said the tobacco industry can't advertise on radio and television, at least they could say, well, these are federal airways, federal licenses. Now the government is saying they're going to regulate a billboard. And, and, and when the tobacco industry wants to challenge the constitutionality, they say, well, it's free speech. Well, what about the fact that the Constitution doesn't give the government the authority to regulate? We have basically in this country said that the federal government is all-powerful. They can do anything they want whatever they want, there is no limitation on what they can spend, what they can tax, what they can regulate. Is there any freedom left in the United <laughs> States of America? And I don't want you to compare us to the old East Germany or, 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 or even to Great Britain today, but to what we grew up expecting, what the founders bequeathed to us, what you and I and Peter and many of the people watching us now have come to believe was the freest place on the planet. Well, I, I actually moved here from Israel, so I'm an immigrant to this country. And it's a huge disappointment because I, you know, had this image of what freedom in this country would really be. And ever since I got here, I came in 87, freedom has slowly been eroding. And this is a process that didn't begin with Obama, didn't begin with Bush. It began 100 years ago, even before that. It is a slow erosion of real freedom, of what it means to be an individual, what it means to have individual <coughs> rights in this country. That whole concept of individualism is disappearing uh, is disappearing fast and this is you know this financial regulation is just a manifestation of that it's a manifestation of of we've lost what the spirit of individualism does it say something about our society that that people in the government think this is normal rather than irregular and that the people to whom the president was addressing his comments earlier today probably would say, well, yeah, the government is sticking up for me. They're doing something for well, me. Have we so <laughs> lost sight of common sense and reason that we would buy this nonsense? Well, that's the whole idea. But look, look at what happened from September 11th. You know, one other, you know, things that come up, you know, when they audit me in, in, in uh, my securities firm is, you know, am I complying with the, the anti money laundering laws? Am I complying with uh, the Patriot Act correctly? There's been so much additional regulation piled on the financial services industry as a result of September 11th. And, 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 and the absurdity of the situation where you can have major brokerage firms laying off people by the thousands getting rewarded with billions of dollars of government money. And now you have a small firm like me trying to hire some of the people that they're firing and then being fined for growing too fast.
That's, that's America. That's America today. But, when, when you and I met in the yeah. hallway, <laughs> I, I kiddingly said to you that I got in a little trouble with my uh, parents when they saw on my nightstand when I was about 12 or 13 years old a book called The, the Virtue, Virtue of, of Selfishness, Selfishness by Ayn Rand. You are the president of the Ayn Rand Institute. I, I'm a pre-Vatican II, old-fashioned, <laughs> traditional Catholic, but I love this book. What did she mean? What do well, you mean when you say selfishness is a virtue? And this is, this is really the key, because I think th that, th the misunderstanding of what selfishness is, or what self-interest is, is, is what's behind all these regulations and all these controls. What Ayn Rand meant is that your highest moral obligation is to your own life, is to make your life the best life that it can be. So to think rationally about what are the values that I need to pursue in order to be happy, in order to be successful, in order to prosper, what a, you know, and that, that, that pursuit, that, that rational thought, that is the essence of morality instead of the conventional morality that says, think of others first. My mother used to tell me, think of yourself last. Be selfless, right? That is the essence of morality, selflessness. Ayn Rand rejects that. She says, no, the essence of morality is taking care of yourself, personal responsibility for your own life and happiness, making the most out of your time here on Earth. Does this, does this philosophy subsist anywhere in economic circles today, other than amongst our <laughs> friends at, Von, at the Von Mises Institute and our friends at Ayn Rand and Un those un few who defend the free market? Unfortunately, no, and it's the basis of, of, uh, of free market capitalism. Well, the, whole, the whole invisible hand is based on that fact, that when people pursue their own self-interest, they're led by an invisible hand to help everybody else. And the people is... who have done the most good in this world for others are the people who you know, started businesses and invented things because they wanted to get rich and they enriched everybody else in the process. But this is, this is the difference that, that Ayn Rand, where Ayn Rand is different than Adam Smith and many of the conservatives. Ayn Rand says you should pursue your own self-interest because that is what morality is about. Not for the greater good, not because society is better off. True, society, the economy is better off. Well, the ancillary, that's just, the, right, that's the ancillary, the ancillary result yes. is, is society better off, but the essence is pursuing your own self-interest. And I think that is the number one thing that the advocates of capitalism need to pick up on. We need to defend the right, which our founding fathers understood, at least politically, right. if How not ethically, to pursue our own individual and, and It doesn't that. mean that you reject charity or you reject no, helping other people. Absolutely you, not. If, if it's voluntary and if it's within your own values, if you choose to do it because well, it the supports the essence of your this, life. The essence of this is your moral right to make a free choice. It's impossible for the government to be charitable because the government has taken its money by force. It's somebody else's money. Well, but money. There, are lots of, there are lots of moral systems out there that believe that it's okay to force people to do what's good. Uh, you know, this is, again, Ayn Rand says, no, you, you, you have a moral obligation to do what's really good for you, not to pretend, not just to eliminate guilt, but to do what's truly right, put good on for your, you. Put on but, your history. But look at, the, look at the financial industry. The problem is that what we've done is we've mistaken Madoff as self-interested. Madoff's not self-interested. Bernie Madoff was self-destructive. He destroyed his own life. He destroyed everything he touched. He is the exact opposite of a truly self-interested financier. Yeah. And that's why when we view all self-interest, when we view capitalism as Bernie Madoff's, which the culture does, unfortunately, then the perception is, oh, we need government to step in and, hang on, hang on. and protect us from, from the, the, pre from the president. The speech he gave a few minutes ago when he was uh, giving his version, his spin on this nonsense, attacked uh, executives, financial executives, for being greedy. And that type of an attack resonates with the American public. What's the answer to that? Well, I mean, but everybody is greedy. All the, every American, nobody, no one goes to work and says to their boss, "I like a pay cut." You know, I don't want to, I don't want to earn as much money. I'd rather have give it to somebody else. Everybody tries to succeed. Everybody tries to make as much money as they can, given their abilities and their talents. I mean, you know, to, to, to just say somebody is evil because they're greedy. The problem is, the reason Wall Street greed became so destructive is because of government intervention, government policy, yeah. which circumvented the free market forces and the disciplines that would have been imposed by fear. Everybody is greedy, but everybody is fearful. The government let everybody throw caution to the wind. The government said, be greedy, don't worry, because we've got your back. We're going to bail you out. We've guaranteed this debt. And we're, and we're making speculation so cheap with these low interest rates that you'd be a fool not to borrow the money. Government creates incentives to be short-term and irrational, uh, you know, true greed. True self-interest is about long-term and about rationality. But the government distorts that. It makes it impossible to look long-term 
or creates a perception of a long term that doesn't really well, exist. And, of, and that's probably our, because that's all they can think of is the next election. So since they're sure, so short-sighted, they just assume it about everybody else.